can you just tell us a little bit about what you do that sort of thing so i currently work for a conservation charity in london and i'm finishing my master's at oxford um i study biodiversity conservation and management so i'm hoping to talk a little bit about the relationship between colonialism and the climate crisis and how we got here basically before we get into just talking about colonialism and the climate crisis in a bit more detail um just want to talk a bit about what's going on in bangladesh at the moment um because i think that's sort of how we've ended up talking about this in general um so for those who don't know there is a lot of flooding going on in select in bangladesh um halima i know obviously that's where your roots are so would you want to yeah, tell, tell us about it that's where i'm from um so bangladesh is actually like a lot of people in the world don't know bangladesh apart from know it as a place of like poverty and just constant like climate devastation it's like it's very 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 flat um the country so it's obviously prone to a lot of flooding with rising sea levels and excessive rainfall and things like that and this year Silla, so in the north east of bangladesh um was really really um impacted and kind of the thing that i want to highlight about it because obviously like being from bangladesh there's, it's, it's like every year you know every single year there's flooding um 80 percent of the country is actually flood plain right um and it's something like 90 percent of people in the country are exposed to some kind of like climate devastation um but to talk about climate devastation in bangladesh and to, to do that conversation justice what you actually have to have a conversation about is climate injustice um so bangladesh obviously it's a very small country we are one of the most densely populated countries um we do have quite a large population of people um but we do not emit anywhere near as much um what's the what wait greenhouse gases so like our greenhouse gas emission is is like disproportionately low so america for so we for example the average person in bangladesh emits 0.5 metric tons of co2 per year in the u.s the average person emits 15.2 so that's like about 30 times more so it's countries like america for example rich countries in the west that are disproportionately emitting co2 emissions and then it's countries like bangladesh that are paying the price for it um so yeah i think if we're gonna have a conversation about um climate devastation it has to be kind of rooted in that um that disproportionate relationship and also kind of that relationship with colonialism which i won't say too much about because we do have josephine here to talk a little bit about that yeah i mean going off what you've just said a few days ago the supreme court in the us actually um i don't know the exact name of the law of it but they recently put something in place which basically gives each state the right to decide how they're going to conduct their climate policy how laws will work in their own country as opposed to having the us as a whole have laws go out and i think that feeds into what you're saying the us is one of the largest emitters on the planet they're the second largest um china is the first um and people in the states and the states is they're not really committing to the climate um goals that they've set out to or that we've promised as per the paris agreement um in 2015 several countries they all got together and they said you know one of the things they said was we should be giving 100 billion dollars per year to lower middle income countries to help them um adapt to climate change and i think that's something that feeds into the whole thing because if countries in the global north were committing to that countries like bangladesh would now have something in place that could support the people but we've massively failed to meet that and i think that as well feeds into the whole colonialism thing um the climate crisis is a byproduct of colonialism we wouldn't be here if not for the european age of enlightenment this age of reason where scientists from about in the 17th century started going to different countries and thinking oh this is interesting this is nice this exploitation of the land this exploitative nature is why we're here one of the biggest drivers of climate change is this take 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 from the land and from nature and we're at a point now where we're feeling the impacts of climate change right now they're not future they're not 2050 well mm -hmm. you know we have to do things before then it's happening right now and it has been happening um and it is it is a byproduct of colonialism and i think until we have that climate justice conversation until we acknowledge the history we can't really move forward 
and people are going to keep suffering and it's it's really just a devastating thing um and people are unwilling to have that conversation um i think we can all guess why they're unwilling to have that conversation but you know that that's why we're here really i think as well like something that i find quite difficult is I understand like everyone, all of us, we do have a, um, a, a personal responsibility, right? To kind of help meet global ca- uh, climate goals. The difficulty I find is then when kind of people become so um, laser focused on smaller things like plastic straws and, and all of these things, which do make a difference. But actually like from what, from my understanding, it's the big corporations, right? Like when millionaires and billionaires are taking private jet planes as as their like normal mode of travel and um places like amazon and um you know cryptocurrency now are, are kind of like burning down absolute rainforests to build warehouses and um and 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 corporate co- corporations are um polluting the sea and and, and all of these things for me personally i do wonder like how far is it is it a distraction tactic you know is is saying telling everyday people like use a paper straw and recycle and things like that which i do agree we should be doing anyway but is that not a diversion tactic from the actual conversation and the actual like accountability that, that needs to be had i think individual action will always help but i think the individual actions that we're being told to do and the ones that will actually be beneficial are very, very different. Using paper straws, okay, yes, there's going to be less plastic in the ocean. It's not going to end up in turtles' noses, which is obviously a great thing. But the individual person, it doesn't matter how much you cycle or if you go vegan, if someone like Elon Musk wants to go to Mars every month, you just can't combat that. Individual action that is actually meaningful and beneficial is who you vote for, and holding those people that you vote for accountable, demanding that the climate promises that they've made are met. The individual should be protesting when our politicians are not doing what they said that they should. And individual people should be shopping um, consciously. Consumerism is one of the, another big driver of why we're here, um, the climate crisis. Fast fashion, for example, I think a lot of us know that this is a huge problem with respect to climate change and biodiversity loss, um, just that nature of buying things, keeping up with trends. If the individual person wants to tackle the climate crisis, it's who you vote for, it's holding those people accountable, and it's using your money to vote as well, in a sense, like what you buy is a huge way that you can actually influence change. Um, Obviously, it's great to cycle, and it's great to eat less meat, and yes let's all please stop using single use plastic like that's definitely enough but it is it is a diversion tactic in a way because it's making people feel guilty for their small little mistakes like using a plastic straw because let's be honest like paper straws are really jarring like no one likes them Mm. like they just they don't work um but if people are thinking you know I i should cycle to work i shouldn't drive today they're not thinking about the people who've flown a private jet today once you feel the guilt of the climate crisis you're not thinking about what everyone else is doing and yes you should be thinking about your own actions Mm. but it's this big it's this bigger problem it's this wider issue and the people that want you to be focusing on your own actions and just getting on with doing these small day-to-day activities these are the people that have also benefited from colonialism in the past. Think about Elon Musk and like where he comes from mm-hmm. and his wealth and his ability to now be where he is. People like that don't want you to hold them accountable for what they've done. Yeah. Jeff Bezos, for example, that nature of taking from the land, stripping forests, cutting down trees, emitting carbon just to get overnight deliveries from Amazon. They don't want you to see that they are colonizing nature it's so true like actually when you think about it and you think about like what colonialism was i think at the root of it it's, it was a sense of entitlement right like mm-hmm. entitlement from a land and its people but like, literally that is the story of colonialism it's it is white people from the west going over to these lands and 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 claiming their stake when there actually wasn't a stake to be had and 
a lot of people would look at that and be like, oh, okay, so because colonies don't exist, like we don't have colonialism, but we have colonial attitude, right? And we have like mm-hmm. um, colonial mindset still. Um, 100%, like you said, someone like Elon Musk, what Joseph Jos- was referring to, he is a South Af- or white South African. <laughs> and, you know, we don't need to go too much into the that story because if you know, you know. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it is, it is these billionaires who think that they out of everyone else in the world out of out of the seven billion people and and countless trillions of animals that they share this planet with they are the people that actually um have the right and have the entitlement to a disproportionate number of resources because i don't know the figure but i know that it's like a minuscule percentage of people in the world that control wealth and resources i think it's genuinely something like the not 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 five percent people it's a shockingly small i mean the amount of people who are in charge of what goes on could probably fit in a medium-sized room i think you'd actually be very very surprised if you saw the people who have the power and saw the people that were able to make the change if they wanted to but it doesn't suit them yet um and i think when we're having the conversation about colonialism it's really important to note that like colonialism and capitalism are two sides of the same coin and they feed into each other so heavily and again that's that's why we're here that's a huge problem and even coming from a conservation background like there's this there's this call for the green economy um trying to fix problems with what caused them in the first place thinking if we just greenwash everything it'll fix things but it, that's that, that's not the solution i think degrowth is really the solution but again degrowth is at direct odds with colonial ideology because it's the expectation that you can take more and more and more, exploit more and more and more, gain more. Mm-hmm. And whoever loses out, loses. Yeah. Because that's what it is. It, it's, it's, this, it's, an, it's a system that requires um, chaos. Yeah, yeah, 100. Mm-hmm. And like be- before just now, I said, oh, the, okay, people have this idea like colonies are over, but we still have colonial mindset. Actually, I want to take that a little bit further and talk about... Yeah. Um, it's a it's a more of a philosophical question about to what extent has the world actually been decolonized when there are still structural continuities that allow people like musk and bezos and all of these billionaires from the west to still have material stake in former colonies um and i'm thinking everything from like you know the cobalt mines in congo and and the kind of like like literal slave labor that that necessitates you know and then like who Apple is an American company, you know? So once again, like colonialism might have been over, the colonies might not exist anymore, but there was still a, a, structurally, there was still apparatuses in place where people from the West were able to go over to these places um, that are rich in resources um, and wage wars where they didn't have apparatuses in play. I'm talking Mm -hmm. about the war in the Middle East, you know, in Iraq and things like that. Um, yeah, I think that speaks a lot to actually how how structurally the world was never really decolonized. No, it's just good. it's colonialism. It took a new form. It it, right, it changed its face. Maybe it changed its name, but it's the same tactics are at play. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. the same players are involved. The great great grandchildren of the people who did it before are doing it now, yeah. and mm-hmm. we're starting to feel the impacts. Yeah. I think maybe two hundred years ago. There was, I think globalization as well is a big thing that has meant that we are able to really see the impacts of climate change because, you know, 200 years ago, you don't know what floods are going on here. You don't know what droughts are going on there. You don't know what wildfires are going on there. But when you see it every day through social media, you're aware just how big of a problem this is. Right. But it's a problem people aren't willing to talk about. But yeah, it's, it's the same structure. And it's a structure that requires that we... The general public dismantle it um we can't keep doing the same thing we can't go further into the tunnel thinking will come out it's it's time to turn around a little bit um acknowledge the history say that was that was terrible we need to stop taking from the land we need to give people their land we need to put structures in place to support people who've already felt the devastation of the climate crisis it's uh, it's uh, then a, a kind of conversation about foreign foreign relations and diplomatic relations and what is America doing in the Middle East and and why what is America doing in 
the the mines in Africa and all of these things. Um, actually, I think we need to start questioning those things as well. No, we definitely do. Questioning the presence of these people in 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 countries of the global south. I think it's especially um, sad and I ironic as well. Like in somewhere like Bangladesh, which obviously we're talking about fast fashion and the links between capitalism yeah. and consumerism <laughs> and colonialism. And obviously, Bangladesh, I believe, is like one of the places with the highest concentration of like warehouses for these fast fashion brands. Um, but obviously, uh, it's ironic because the negative effects on the climate are then affecting these places, which are being utilized by the West to actually enable yeah. this, this continuity of consumerism, colonialism, etc. Yeah.